The Franks were a Germanic tribe that emerged during the late antiquity period and became a dominant power in Western Europe. Initially settling in the Roman province of Gaul, roughly modern-day France and some parts of Germany, they established a series of kingdoms under the Merovingian dynasty in the 5th century. The Franks are particularly noted for their conversion to Christianity under King Clovis I, which allied them with the Roman Church and distinguished them from other Germanic groups. Under the later Carolingian dynasty, which succeeded the Merovingians, the Franks reached their zenith with the reign of Charlemagne, who was crowned emperor in the year 800, symbolically reviving the Western Roman Empire. If you want to learn about them, then you've come to the right place. Hello and welcome to the channel. If you're new here, it's good to meet you. If you're coming back, it's good to have you with me again. As always, if you'd like to support the channel, links to the Patreon are in the description and comments. Otherwise, liking the video helps YouTube know that you're enjoying it, and then they'll let other people know as well. So, thank you in advance. Now, let's get on with our video for today. A History of the Franks now, first of all, where did the Franks come from? Well, once more, we walk the thin line between history and mythology. The mythological origins of the Franks are detailed in several early medieval sources, which provide fascinating but largely fictional accounts of the tribe's ancestry. According to the History of the Franks by Gregory of Tours, a historian from the 6th century, the Franks may have originated from Pannonia, settling initially along the Rhine River before moving through Thuringia and establishing a ruling class in the regions they conquered. There is, however, a more fantastical tale that appears in the Chronicle of Fredegar around the 7th century, which claims that the Franks were actually descendants of Trojans, linking them to the ancient epic heroes of Virgil's writings. Fredegar narrates that after the fall of Troy, the Franks, under leaders such as Friga and Francio, journeyed from Asia to Macedonia, and eventually to the banks of the Rhine, where they purportedly attempted to rebuild a new Troy. Well, it's a nice story. The Liber Historiae Francorum, another key source from the 8th century, echoes this Trojan lineage by suggesting that the Franks, under leaders like Priam and Antenor, migrated from Troy to Pannonia, and then to the region near the Sea of Azov. This text adds that after aiding the Romans in military campaigns, the group was dubbed the Franks, a name that implied fierceness in battle. Well, of course, modern observers critique these accounts, noting that they reveal the Franks' lack of a unified heritage, or ancient noble lineage, compared to other contemporaneous groups. This absence likely drove to the creation of these grandiose legends, aiming to construct a prestigious origin story for a relatively young confederation of tribes. Of course, Historical revisionism is more or less as old as history itself. The early mentions of the Franks in historical sources show their interactions with the Roman Empire, highlighting both cooperative and hostile engagements. The Panegyrici Latini, along with writers like Ammianus Marcellinus, 
Claudian, Zosimus, and particularly Gregory of Tours, provide fragmented but valuable insights into the movements and cultural backdrop of the Frankish tribes. From these accounts, we can summarize that the Franks first emerged in the historical record in the late 3rd century. Their initial appearance is noted during the 260s, when they began to exert pressure on Roman territories. Various Frankish groups like the Chamavi, Brukteri, Chatuari, and Sali, or Salians, also the Tubantes and Amsivari, are sporadically mentioned in Roman accounts from the late 3rd throughout the 4th century. The Franks are often mentioned in Roman sources under two categories, that being the Laeti, for allies, and Deretici, the enemies or surrendered foes. Of course, to the Roman world, there's only two kinds of people, allies and enemies. Notable episodes include a group of Franks reaching as far as Tarragona in Spain, around the year 260, where they caused significant disruption until the Roman forces repelled them, but that wasn't until a decade later. By the end of the 3rd century, the Roman leadership took a more aggressive campaigns against the Franks. The Emperor Maximian is recorded as having subdued the Salian Franks along with other groups in 288, relocating them within the Empire's borders. Why did they do this? Well, one, they wanted to utilize their manpower, but two, if they were inside the borders, they could somewhat keep an eye on them and curb further incursions. I mean, they weren't going to be making any incursions if they were already in. Not bad logic. Keep your friends close and enemies closer, perhaps. Now, the strategic relocation of these tribes by Roman authorities, as recorded by Eumenius, who refers to the expulsions and resettlements constructed by Constantius, reflect Rome's broader policy of barbarian management through resettlement. Of course, the policy aimed at both fortifying the Roman borders and slowly assimilating these groups into Roman military and economic systems. Further, the Frankish presence along the Rhine is marked on the Tabula Petinguriana, a medieval copy of a Roman map, which identifies places occupied by the Franks, such as the region Osp opposite rather to Nijmegen and Zanten, which is labelled as Francia. Now, the Salian Franks, mentioned by Ammianus Marcellinus in the context of Julian's campaigns in 358 played a foundational role in the history of the Frankish people and their expansion within the Roman Empire. As foederati, or federated groups, the Salians were allowed to settle in Texuandria, a region moved from their original settlements around the rhine Maas delta this strategic relocation facilitated their role, both within and eventually beyond the Roman imperial borders. By the 5th century, the Salians, along with other Frankish groups, began to exert control over the river Scheldt, disrupting maritime transport to Britain and showcasing their burgeoning power as both allies and threats within the Roman domains. Despite Roman efforts to pacify them, their presence as pirates persisted, showing the challenge the Empire faced in controlling these martial groups. 
The Salians southward push into what is now modern France marked the beginning of their significant territorial expansion. This movement is closely associated with the establishment of the Merovingian dynasty, which famously codified the Salian law, Lex Salica. This law is notably applied in the Neustrian region, indicating the new geographical and political realities shaped by the Salians beyond their original settlements. The Silva Carbonaria, or Charcoal Forest, served as a geographical boundary that the Salians crossed under the leadership of figures like Chlodio, whom extended Frankish control into areas such as Tournai, Artois, Cambrai, and the Somme region. Chlodio's legacy, as recounted by Gregory of Tours, positioned him as an ancestor to the Merovingian kings, with Childeric and later his son Clovis expanding and consolidating the Frankish rule. Childeric collaborated with Roman forces, reflecting the complex interdependence between Roman authorities and their barbarian foederati. His activities in the Loire region and beyond contributed to the foundation of what would become the Frankish kingdom of Neustria, essentially the heartland of later medieval France. Clovis's reign further solidified this trajectory by unifying the Frankish tribes under his rule and extending his authority eastward past the Silva Carbonaria into Belgica, laying the foundation for the kingdom of Austrasia. This region later adopted the Ripuarian law, another Frankish legal code that was distinct from that of Salian law. The Rhineland Franks, often differentiated from the Salians, and sometimes known as Ripuarian Franks in modern scholarship, were situated along a crucial stretch of the Rhine, spanning from Mainz to Duisburg, including the region around modern-day Cologne. This area, historically tied to the Ubi tribe, and encompassing parts of both Germania Inferior and Germania Superior, played its own role in the development of Frankish territories, and certainly a significant one. While the Rhineland Franks, like the Salians, appear in Roman records as both raiders and allies, depending on the time and context, documentation regarding their official settlement within the Roman Empire's borders remains somewhat unclear. They managed to establish control over key locations such as Cologne, and, over time, were possibly referred to as Ripuarians, a name likely deriving from river people, due to their proximity to the Rhine. Very creative. The term Ripuarians is often linked with the Lex Ripuaria, a Merovingian legal code. However, it's important to note that this code was applicable not just in Ripuarian regions, but across all Frankish lands, indicating a broader administrative application than what was initially being assumed. The distinction between Salian and Ripuarian Franks, while very useful, does not necessarily reflect the rigid historical or territorial divisions, but rather differentiations that emerged over time within the broader Frankish identity. Giordane's account in his Getica, mentioning the Ripari alongside other groups like the Franchi and Saxones, 
during the Battle of Chalons in 451 suggests a very complex interplay of tribal identities under Roman command. However, these ripari are generally interpreted as a distinct group based along the Rhone, not as Ripuarian Franks from the Rhine region. As part of the Merovingian realm, Ripuarian territories were integral to the Kingdom of Austrasia, a core component of Merovingian power. This kingdom encompassed not only areas associated with the Salian and Ripuarian Franks, but also extended into Roman Germania Inferior, and even parts of Gallia Belgica. Over time, Austrasia evolved to include regions that correspond to medieval Lower and Upper Lotharingia, with territories stretching from the Rhine's west bank across to the lands east of the river. Gregory of Tours provides a detailed account of the Frankish kingdoms in the 5th century, highlighting several small kingdoms around regions like Cologne, Tournai, and Cambrai. During this period, the Merovingian dynasty began to emerge as a dominant force, perhaps leveraging its connections with Roman military and administrative structures in northern Gaul. This period marked the integration of Frankish leaders into the Roman military hierarchy, which played a crucial role in their rise to power. In the mid-fifth century, Childeric I, a Salian Frank, served as a military commander in Roman Gaul, alongside other leaders with equally diverse ethnic backgrounds. He was temporarily eclipsed by the Roman commander Aegidius, who maintained control over the Frankish kingship connected with the Roman forces along the Loire for about eight years. The concept of a kingship during this era, inspired by figures such as Alaric I, represented a new form of leadership that set the stage for the Merovingian ascendancy. After Aegidius's death around 464 or 465, Childeric regained prominence, and his son, Clovis, continued to expand their influence. Clovis went on to achieve significant victories, including the defeat of Sigargrius, a Roman ruler of the kingdom of Soissons, in 486 or 487, also the subjugation of other Frankish kings such as Chararic and Ragnacar. His conquests laid the groundwork for what would become a consolidated Frankish kingdom. By 509, Clovis had vanquished the Ripuarian Franks and established Paris as his capital, becoming the first king to rule over all the Frankish tribes. His realm was characterized by significant territorial expansion, including the defeat of the Visigoths at the Battle of Wallet and the eventual integration of regions like Burgundy, Provence, and Brittany by his successors. Clovis's death led to the division of his kingdom among his four sons, who managed to maintain a unified front long enough to conquer Burgundy in 534. However, the subsequent generation saw intense rivalry, particularly between the queens Brunhilda and Fritigunda, which fueled ongoing conflicts among the descendants of Clovis. These rivalries led to the formation of three distinct sub-kingdoms, Austrasia, Neustria, and Burgundy, each seeking to assert dominance over the others. The political centre of the Frankish realm 
gradually shifted to the Rhineland, thanks in part to the influence of the Arnulfing clan in Austrasia. By 613, the realm was reunified under Clothar II, who issued the Edict of Paris to strengthen royal authority and curb corruption. His son, Dagobert I's reign, marked the zenith of Merovingian power, which declined under subsequent kings, known as Le Roi Fainance, the do-nothing kings. The final shift in power occurred when Pepin the Short, a mayor of the palace, deposed the last Merovingian king, Childeric III, in 751, with ecclesiastical and aristocratic support, founding the Carolingian dynasty. This transition marked the end of the Merovingian era, and the beginning of a new chapter in the history of the Frankish kingdom, namely, the Carolingian Empire. The division of the Carolingian Empire after Louis the Pious's death was formalized in the Treaty of Verdun in 843, which partitioned the empire among his three surviving sons. This division reflected the complex dynastic, cultural, and religious tensions within the empire, and set the stage for the development of modern European states. Louis's eldest son, Lothair I, received the middle portion of the empire, which included parts of modern-day Italy, the Low Countries, and regions around the Rhine and Rhone rivers, effectively controlling the imperial title. Charles the Bold was granted the western part, which evolved into modern France, and Louis the German, well, you can guess which part he received, which would eventually become the core of the Holy Roman Empire. The tripartite division led to a political fragmentation, and of course frequent conflicts over borders and authority. The lack of a strong central authority led to the rise of local powers, such as the feudal lords, who often held more actual power in practical terms than the actual kings. As each region developed interdependently, independently rather, distinct cultural, social and linguistic identities began to form. The use of vernacular languages increased, and gradually Latin was eclipsed in many areas. Different parts of the Carolingian Empire developed different economic systems based on their geography and resources, influencing their future economic stability and development. The Carolingian Renaissance, which had flourished under Charlemagne, continued to influence these regions, albeit in varying degrees. Charlemagne's efforts to revive classical knowledge and improve education had lasting effects on the intellectual life of Europe. Oh, and by the way, I'm only just going to talk about Charlemagne a little bit in this, since we don't really have time. But I've already done an entire hour-long video on him, a complete biography, which you'll be able to find probably in the medieval history section of the playlist. Monasteries and cathedrals continued to be centers of learning and literacy, preserving not only religious knowledge, but also secular texts from antiquity. However, the unity imposed by Charlemagne would never be fully realized again, and the fragmentation of the empire eventually led to the development of feudalism in Europe, 
this system of local governance, characterized by the decentralization of power, became a defining feature of the Middle Ages. Now, on to a few specifics of the Carolingian Empire, namely some of their culture, some notes about their language, religion, and then we'll have a look at their military structure. The Old Frankish Language It's often called Old Franconian, spoken by the Franks prior to the High German consonant shift between 6 and 700 AD. This shift significantly influenced the linguistics of the region, leading to a divergence where dialects that would become Dutch did not experience the shift while others did, albeit to varying extents. Consequently, the distinction between Old Dutch and Old Frankish is actually quite minimal, with Old Dutch or Low Old Franconian often used to denote these variations post-shift. Oh, and by the way, they do say that Dutch is the easiest language for native English speakers to learn. That has very little to do with the Franks, but I'm just commenting. The direct evidence of Old Frankish is scarce, primarily limited to a few runic inscriptions, such as the Burgerker inscription. However, a considerable portion of Frankish vocabulary has been reconstructed through early Germanic loanwords in Old French, and comparative linguistic reconstruction, particularly through Dutch. I have no idea how they do all of this with these old languages, but some very, very smart people, some very cunning linguists, of course. The impact of Old Frankish on Gallo-Roman language and culture, including vocabulary and phonological changes, remains a significant area of scholarly inquiry. Notably, Frankish influence on contemporary vocabulary includes words for the cardinal directions, you know, north, south, east, west, and also an estimated 1,000 other words. Linguistically, Northern Gaul became bilingual region of Vulgar Latin and Frankish during the Frankish conquest, while Latin remained the language of writing and formal affairs. Culturally and artistically, the early Frankish contributions are part of the migration period art, transitioning into what is recognized as Carolingian art or pre-Romanesque architecture. Surviving Merovingian architecture is rare, with the majority of early churches likely being constructed in timber. The best preserved example includes a baptistery in Poitiers, reflecting a Gallo-Roman style. Furthermore, artifacts such as jewellery, weapons, and manuscript illuminations provide insight into the aesthetic and cultural values of the time. The grave of Queen Aragund and the treasure of Gourdon highlight the artistry of the period though the overall quality may not be fully represented by the surviving works. The Carolingian Renaissance, later marked as a significant cultural transformation, of course heavily influenced by Charlemagne's patronage of the arts, included the commission of works from abroad. Carolingian art and architecture such as the Palatine Chapel in Aachen, demonstrate a confident adaptation of Byzantine influences and sophistication that set the stage for future developments in Western art. Other notable Carolingian sites include the monasteries of Centula, 
St. Gall, and the original Cologne Cathedral. Look that one up, it's pretty. Now, a little bit about religion. Because, of course, it kind of goes hand in hand with culture, doesn't it? The conversion of the Frankish aristocracy to Christianity followed quickly after Clovis. Although converting the entire population under Frankish rule was a very long and complex process. Frankish paganism, which persisted in some forms, shared many traits with broader Germanic paganism, being highly ritualistic and centered around a pantheon of localized deities. Among these was possibly the Quinnator, a mythological water god linked to the Merovingian lineage. Frankish religious practices were deeply entwined with their daily lives and linked to specific regional cult centers, beyond which their gods held no sway or authority. Archaeological evidence, such as the burial of Childeric I, where his body was adorned with cloth decorated with bees, suggests a symbolic connection in pagan rituals, potentially linking the angon, a type of spear that means sting, hinting at a martial deity or spirit. The fleur de lis, a symbol later associated with the French royalty, may also derive from this weapon. The pivotal moment for Frankish Christianity came, of course, with Clovis, who converted to Catholicism in 496 after his marriage to the Burgundian Catholic Clotilla, and a decisive military victory, believed to be divine intervention. This event led to the baptism of Clovis and thousands of his warriors, significantly aligning the Frankish kingdom with the Catholic Church, unlike other Germanic tribes, which were promptly Arian. Now, Arian was just a different point of view. You had Arian Christianity and then the Roman Catholic Christianity. Arianism, of course, was the one that fell out of favor. Clovis's conversion facilitated a smoother leadership between the church and the Frankish state, which was, of course, pivotal for the spread of Christianity in Western Europe. Despite the swift conversion of the Frankish elite, the complete Christianization of the populace was going to take some time. And by some time, I mean centuries. And, of course, they had to overcome considerable resistance. You know what that means. Ragnarkar, a Frankish noble who initially supported Clovis's rise, later rallied a massive group of pagans against his conversion. This, of course, led to his execution. The ongoing Christianization efforts were largely advanced through the establishment and expansion of monastic networks across the kingdom. The Merovingian church, of course, faced its own challenges including integrating with the existing Gallo-Roman ecclesiastical structure, Christianizing pagan customs, and defining a new theological foundation for Merovingian kingship that had pagan roots. Of course, it's easy to get people to slightly change their pagan customs, rather than give them up completely. This is how we get a lot of our modern sort of festivals around different things. We effectively co-opted the old ways and changed the flavor, but not the recipe, let's put it like that. Well, 
The church also had to manage the influence of Irish and Anglo-Saxon missionaries and meet the administrative demands of the papacy. Monasticism flourished, endorsed by the wealth of the Merovingian elite and driven by waves of hermeticism which eventually led to the widespread adoption of the Benedictine rule. The relationship between the church and the Merovingian kings was often quite strained, particularly as kings sometimes displayed pagan practices, such as polygamy. It's hard to give that one up. The transition from the Galician to the Roman Rite was actually encouraged by Rome, and the eventual rise of the Carolingian mayors of the palace crowned by the Pope marked a significant realignment of the church towards a more stable governance under a Christian emperor. Well, of course, they had developed their own legal system as well, so let's take a look at that. The legal systems of the Franks, like that of any other Germanic tribe, was originally based solely on oral traditions, with laws memorized and recited by officials known as Rackenbergs, similar to the law speakers found in Scandinavian cultures. By the 6th century, these laws began to be recorded in written form, marking a significant transition in the administration of justice among the Franks. They were governed by primarily two legal codes, the Salic Law for the Salian Franks and the Ripuarian Law for the Ripuarian Franks. These legal systems reflect the distinct tribal origins and settlements of the Frankish people, the Gallo-Romans and the clergy in regions south of the River Loire continued to be governed by traditional Roman law, indicating a coexistence of Germanic and Roman legal principles in this area, and I hazard to say that the Romans thought that theirs was quite a bit better. Now, Germanic law, including that of the Franks, primarily focused on individual rights and personal justice, rather than state interests. This approach to law emphasized the importance of resolving disputes at a more personal level, with cases involving personal property or injury receiving meticulous attention. This focus on individual and personal issues in Frankish legal practice shows the fundamentally different priorities and social structures compared to those of the Roman low legal system, rather, which was more centrally organized and focused around the state. The Frankish legal tradition underscores a societal framework where personal honor, property rights, and community standings were of the greatest importance. Now, let's do a little bit about the military history and how the Franks composed their armies. The integration and influence of Germanic tribes, including the Franks within the Roman military framework, significantly shaped the development of military practices in late antiquity. In fact, the participation of Germanic peoples in the Roman army dates back to the time of Julius Caesar, but their role became increasingly prominent following the collapse of Roman authority in Gaul around the 260s AD. One of the first notable instances of Germanic leadership in the Roman military post-collapse was the revolt led by the Batavian commander Postumus. Postumus declaring himself emperor, effectively created a separatist Gallo-Roman empire that restored order and was supported by Germanic soldiers. It was a period that marked the beginning of a trend where Germanic military leaders 
gained substantial influence and command within what remained of the Roman territorial control. A few decades later, another equally significant figure, the Menapian Carousius, formed a Batavian British rump state, relying heavily on Frankish military support. This indicates the growing military capability and autonomy of the Frankish soldiers during this era. And throughout the 4th century, Frankish commanders such as Magnentius, Silvanus, Ricomer, and Bauto held prominent positions within the Roman military itself, showing another way that they were integrated depending on the time and context. Now, Ammianus Marcellinus' accounts provide insights into how Germanic tribes, including the Franks and the Alemanni, adopted Roman military organization and tactics, reflecting a fusion of Roman military discipline with the Germanic warrior culture. This blend of practices continued to evolve, particularly evident after Cholidio's invasion when the Roman armies at the Rhine border essentially became Frankish, adopting Roman-like organizational structures, tactics, and equipment. The observation by the 6th century scholar Procopius that the Arboricoi, having assimilated with the Franks, retained their Roman legionary organization long after the fall of the Western Roman Empire, gives us another example of the lasting Roman influence on Frankish military structure. Well, under the Merovingian dynasty, the Franks melded their Germanic customs with these Romanized military organizations, leading to significant tactical innovations. These changes not only enabled the Franks to expand their territory, but also laid the groundwork for the development of feudal military systems in medieval Europe. The accounts of Procopius and Agathius, when discussing the military customs of the Franks during the 6th century, give us another example of a distinct blend of simplicity and ferocity in their approach to warfare. Yet these narratives are fraught with contradictions and historical complexities. For example, Procopius depicts the Franks as predominantly infantry, armed primarily with axes and swords and shields, eschewing the use of spears or bows in favor of throwing axes that would of course shatter enemy shields and wreak havoc in their ranks. You don't need to have an axe thrown at you to come to the conclusion that it would be quite a frightening ordeal. Either way, this portrayal emphasizes the Frankish preference for close combat and their reliance on heavy shock tactics rather than missile warfare or cavalry maneuvers, which were of course common among other contemporary military forces which seems to be very German. Just get in there, close up, axes, fists. Yeah. yeah, seems a bit German to me. Well, Agathius corroborates some aspects of this depiction, noting that the Franks disdain for body armor and sophisticated military attire suggesting a warrior culture that valued mobility and shock over protection. Lightly armored means light on your feet. Smart. Both historians agree on the Frankish preference for infantry tactics, with Agathius specifically highlighting their skills in hand-to-hand -hand combat and their ability to adapt to different combat situations including the use of the Angon, a type of spear that could be thrown or used in melee. wonder where they got that idea from. However, 
these Byzantine sources contradict each other on the use of the spear and present an image that doesn't really align with archaeological finds or contemporaneous Gallic sources, like Sidonius Apollinaris and Gregory of Tours. These later sources, along with legal codes such as the Lex Ribuaria, provide evidence of a more diversified Frankish military that indeed used spears, helmets, and possibly even some form of male armour, suggesting a more complex and capable military organisation than the Byzantine historians imply. Well, in light of this, while Procopius and Agathius provide a lot of valuable insights into Frankish warfare, their accounts must be considered within the broader scope of all available sources, and that includes archaeological evidence and Frankish legal codes. These suggest a military capability that was both influenced by and distinct from Roman practices, characterized by a flexible approach to warfare that could integrate both Roman and traditional Germanic elements. The Merovingian military, deeply rooted in the Roman traditions, adapted and evolved these influences to form a unique Frankish approach to warfare that was both pragmatic as much as it was versatile. This adaptability was crucial in both defensive and offensive capacities, particularly in their campaigns against external enemies and in internal power struggles within the Frankish realms. The militarized nature of the Merovingian society was evident in the institution of the Marchfeld, an annual assembly where plans for the upcoming campaign season were laid out. These gatherings served not only as strategic planning sessions, but also as demonstrations of royal power and opportunities to affirm loyalty among the Frankish nobility. The focus on displaying military strength showed once again the importance of an armed force in maintaining and extending Merovingian rule. In terms of equipment, the Merovingian forces were well equipped, at least by the standards of the time, drawing heavily on the legacy of the late Roman military system. The elite units and the retinues of nobles would typically wear coats of mails and helmets, and were armed with swords, lances, and shields. These items were not just tools of war, but also kind of like symbols of status within the warrior aristocracy. The influence of Alanic cavalry tactics, which came a lot later, highlighted the integration of diverse military traditions within the Merovingian domain. They also demonstrated considerable tactical flexibility, incorporating siege engines and fortified positions in civil conflicts, while focusing on mobility and rapid strikes in internal campaigns. And, well, what about naval capabilities? Well, though less emphasized in historical records, they were significant, at least comparatively, especially in operations against the Danish incursions. The campaign by Theoderic I in 515 illustrates the strategic use of naval power in protecting and extending Frankish interests along the European coastlines. The Merovingians also incorporated soldiers from conquered or allied regions, such as the Saxons and the Wends, who brought their own weapons and also their own fighting styles into the Frankish military apparatus. This integration, of course, helped in forging a more diverse and versatile military force, 
capable of operating across the varied terrains of the Frankish Empire. Well, with that, we reach the end of our history of the Franks. I hope you enjoyed it, and it was everything you were expecting. I'd like to thank my top-tier Patreon subscribers, that's JC, Stark Factory, and Jeffrey. Thank you very much, lads. If you would like to be a Patreon member too, then I don't have to give you a long explanation on how to do it. Simply follow the link in the description and the comments, and you'll get to where you want to go. Otherwise, I hope you've enjoyed the content, I'm glad you've listened, and thank you once again for joining me. Until next time, all the best. Good night. <laughs>